Dementia. Mm -hmm. Dementia. And uh, her, her management talk, she just said she's done it so often she doesn't even need notes anymore. So uh, I'm going to let her get started and uh, we'll go from there. Thank okay. You. Thank you. Can you hear me all right with a mic and all? I guess so. Um, I'm going to talk about a research project that we have done that has been funded by NIH uh, to look at attempting to find a way to manage uh, behavior problems with dementia patients. And this is in an institutional setting, but I think some of the principles that we use could be used in other settings as well. Can you see that? Um, the title of the project that we did is called Managing Behavioral Symptoms of Alzheimer's Disease and Related Disorders. Uh, several us, of us collaborated on the uh, study. Adrian Linton was the co-investigator and Brenda Cleary manage the control group out in West Texas, and Mike Lichtenstein is part of the uh, geriatric team here at the Health Science University. The purpose of the study was to test the efficacy of using a cognitive developmental model for behavioral and environmental interventions for persons with uh, ADRD. It's very hard to tell if somebody actually has Alzheimer's, so we sort of grouped all the dementing orders into Alzheimer's disease and related disorders. <clears throat> and I'll just give you a sense of what our theoretical framework was. One of the things that we have um, noticed in, in our treatment of working with Alzheimer's patients is that um, people, um, let me see, how, how can I, I've only done this a hundred times and I can't think. Um, a lot of the work that's been done with Alzheimer's patients has been done on trial and error and uh, some things work for some people on some days and some things work for some people on other days. Uh, in a previous study that we did on wandering behavior, we observed wandering behaviors in a nursing home and in the same place where we did this study in a special care unit. And we videotaped people uh, three times, once in the morning, once in the afternoon, and once in the evening. We randomly selected um, observations. And we had two people observe the people's behaviors and just write down what kind of behaviors they had. And we were very surprised in this study because we found that in a structured unit, like a special care unit, the behaviors were not what we expected. We expected sundowning and all kinds of things like that. And what we found was that in this environment, during the day, people were up and around and walking, as you would expect. In the evening, they were less active. And at night, they were in bed and uh, not always asleep, but fairly quiet. The other thing we found in our study was that um, the people who were agitated and taking medications were just as agitated as the people who weren't taking medications. So the medications that were given for agitation didn't seem to help. And um, as a matter of fact, the people who wandered were more likely to be taking medications, psychotropic medications, than those who weren't. So we thought this was kind of curious. Um, so some of the things we learned from that was first a structured environment may help to modify behaviors in Alzheimer's patients, and second, that psychotropic medications don't seem to help doing what they're supposed to do. Uh, the other thing we uh, noticed from observing patients in our own experience and working with Alzheimer's patients is that it seems as though some of the problem behaviors are, are a result of our expectations of people. We expect too much of them or too little of them. And when we expect too much of them, they become frustrated and agitated and 
they're unable to express their agitation and frustration because they're so confused. And so we thought that if we intervened at their appropriate level of abilities, that we would sort of modify that uh, kind of behavior that resulted from our acting inappropriately with them. As I said before, there was also this trial and error um, problem where there was no set way to intervene. You know, there have been a lot of articles um, about how to interact, how to communicate with Alzheimer's patients, but there really was never any um, consistent way to intervene. And also we observed, and maybe you have observed with Alzheimer's patients or somebody with dementia, as the disease progresses, they seem to regress, both socially, physiologically, um, psychologically, and as they regress cognitively, they seem to regress the way children develop in uh, their cognitive abilities. So we equated the stages of dementia with um, the developmental stages that children go through. So um, what we used is a Piaget model. I don't know if, uh, how many of you are familiar with Piaget, but Piaget um, had several stages of development where he could characterize how children develop cognitively. The earliest stage for children is sensory motor. And uh, we divided sensory motor into two phases, early infancy and late infancy. And generally, if you look at somebody in the late stage dementia, they're very much like infants. They are lying in bed uh, in a fetal position often. They seem to retain a sucking reflex. But basically, they can't care for themselves at all. They can't communicate. They can't eat. They can't feed themselves. Uh, they're incontinent. And the same for an in infant. Uh, an infant has certain reflexes and habits, but that's about all an early infant can do. And it's the same with the people in late dementia. They have the sucking reflex. They may have a startle reflex and other reflexes like an infant. Then in middle dementia or moderately severe uh, ADRD, which we equate to late infancy, um, children, if you think of between one and two years, do things by trial and error. They keep trying to do things. Um, they may imitate. Um, object permanence is another um, characteristic of this stage. Uh, I made these slides myself as my first attempt at PowerPoint, so I see a few little problems there. <laughs> I have to work on that. Um, if you notice an infant, I have a one-year-old granddaughter, so I, of course I'm observing her all the time. And of course, she's quite exceptional, so it's hard to tell. <laughs> it's very advanced. Um, but the, what is, for a baby at that stage, what's there is there. And if you don't see it, it's not there. So if you see them in the environment, they're touching things and putting them in their mouths. And it's a, a very um, permanent situation. They look at things, observe them, touch them, feel them, and everything. And if it's not there, they don't see it. I think that's why peekaboo is such, such a good game, because they can cover their face and nobody's there. Um, in this stage of middle dementia, people are like that as well. If you cover something, then uh, like a door, if you don't want them to leave, go out of a door and you cover the door and make it look like a window, like a drape, they won't look behind the drape. They'll not try to get out of the unit and that's often used for patients with dementia. Um, they also have similar qualities to children who are one to two years old. They um, sometimes fear bathing, they fear water sometimes. Uh, they have difficulty putting clothes on properly, and you know, children from one to two need a lot of help with putting clothes on. You usually have to begin the um, putting on the clothes, having them put their arm in the clothes. Um, children at that age so know their own name, usually if, they're if they, people call them, they sort of know their own name. Um, what else? And children at that age also sort of wander and are quite active. And so that's very similar to dementia patients. The next stage of Piaget is pre-operational, and that's uh, two to seven years old. And if you think of children at that age, they begin to understand uh, symbolic thought. Uh, they do parallel play. They concentrate on one thing at a time, and that's very characteristic of people in early dementia, moderate Alzheimer's. Um, they also need coaxing to do things one step at a time. They usually don't relate to other people very well, and they have what you might call parallel play, although they may not be playing, but they'll 
they'll do things alongside one another rather than interact. Um, they also have difficulty choosing proper clothing at this stage. And um, at two to seven years old, usually you have to help a child with clothes, either lay them out or prompt them to dress or help them with, with dressing. So we equated those two stages. Then with um, concrete operations, which is seven to 12 years, children are very, um, think about reason why things happen. They are very rule oriented. If you ever see kids out playing a game, they spend most of their time talking about the rules rather than playing a game. And they're unable to comprehend the future. With mild Alzheimer's, um, they have a decreased ability to perform in demanding employment and social interactions. So uh, unless it's a very structured environment, they're unable to do things that take um, a lot of skilled thinking like um, balancing a checkbook or running a business or whatever. A lot of times you see people uh, initially come into the clinic when they're at this stage and um, they've had difficulty at work and people are coming up, covering up for them or um, you see people who, like women who are great bridge players, have trouble playing bridge or men, um, whatever. So they have difficulty with higher level thinking um, and it's very similar to children at that age. Then formal operations, which let's hope we are all in, is adolescent to adult, and that consists mainly of abstract thinking. And uh, so we don't even consider that's Alzheimer's, that it's sort of normal forgetfulness. Um, one of my own personal theories, and it hasn't been tested or anything, but I think many people in the world are uh, at concrete. I think a lot of people think very concretely, and a lot of people are not at formal operations, and we have found that in our study, that very few people um, achieve the formal operations levels, at least by testing through Piaget. So this was our theoretical framework. We decided that we were going to uh, assess people in their level of Alzheimer's disease by um, their Piaget level and then develop care plans based on their abilities, their cognitive developmental abilities. And even though I say that they're childlike or they become like the stages of cognitive development in children, this is not to say that we uh, treated them with less respect or that we um, infantilized them as some people say or we treated them like children. We treated them like adults, but keeping in mind what their abilities were according to these cognitive developmental levels. And so we had a lot of interventions based on that. So our hypotheses were that there would be a significant correlation over time among Piaget levels and ADR stages. There had been some work done on equating Piaget levels and stages of Alzheimer's, and it had only been done on a cross-sectional basis, and we wanted to look at it over a period of three years to see if there was a relationship that was consistent over three years. And the second hypothesis was that subjects in the treatment group will have significantly fewer problem behaviors and at the same time take fewer psychotropic medications. We were hoping that we could not only decrease problem behaviors using this method, but also try to get them off some of these psychotropic medications that weren't helping anyway. So we had two different groups. Um, we had a treatment group and a control group. And you can see in the control group, we had a lot fewer people. And I would say that's the major limitation of this study. We, for the treatment group, we used a VA hospital that um, had a very consistent population. The control group was um, a group that um, was out in Midland, Texas. It was a private nursing home funded by Medicaid. They'd had a lot of problems and uh, they had a lot of turnover among the patient population. And we had quite a few refusals in that group because there had just been a Medicaid fraud uh, that had occurred. Somebody was going around doing psychological testing and charging Medicaid, and it was not a psychologist. It was um, a good way to make money. And so they were very leery about having anybody come along and do any more testing. Uh, the majority of the sample in both places was white. Um, as you can imagine, the, the treatment group that were more males than females, and it was fairly even in the um, control group. The mental state, the full team mini mental state mean was 13 for the treatment group and um, 11 for the control group. Uh, those of you who are familiar with the mini mental state, that's a mental status exam. The score ranges from 0 to 30. 
and it tests orientation, language skills, math, it's sort of an overall screening for Alzheimer's. Uh, 24 and above indicates that somebody does not, it does not have any cognitive in, impairment. So below 24 indicates that people do have cognitive impairment. So you can see that these people had quite a bit of cognitive impairment when their scores were around 12. Uh, we looked at the baseline Piaget levels. As you can see, we had very few people in the formal operations group. Uh, what we wanted to do was have a broad range of people in the study, so we didn't just have uh, people with Alzheimer's disease in the study. Um, we wanted to be able to compare the Piaget levels with their level of Alzheimer's. So we had one in the treatment group and none in the control group. We had several in the concrete level in the treatment group and five in the control group. We had 17 in the, in the treatment, eight pre-operational uh, in the treatment and five in the control and many sensory motor in the treatment group, 17. So we had about equal 17, I mean concrete and sensory motor in the treatment group and pretty much distributed fairly evenly in the control group. And this were, were the baseline medications. The anxiolytics uh, consisted of drugs like Ativan, uh, things like that. Uh, the antihistamines were very popular for managing um, agitation, in, especially in the uh, VA nursing home. But you can see the, the equivalent doses in the control group. They also had quite a few. Neuroleptics were not quite as many, but they were the ones that we were mainly concerned about because of all the side effects with neuroleptics. And then antidepressants. Um, we looked at all of the drugs and divided them into th these three categories and they seem to work very well as categories. Um, as I said before, the treatment group was a VA hospital, the Kerrville VA with a special care unit. The control group was this private hospital. One of our concerns was that they might be different. Um, they obviously probably would be different and we had to have the treatment group and the control group the same. So we did the MEEP, which is an as environmental assessment for the both facilities to see what their equivalence was and they look at staff and the physical layout and the type of uh, residence they have and actually we found them quite comparable surprisingly except for the level of education and training of the staff and in the VA the level of training and education was higher than in the private uh, nursing home which you can probably imagine a lot of the nurses there were getting their degrees here at the Health Science Center and several were getting master's degrees, so. But they did have a lot of uh, nursing assistants as well, giving the care. So this is the uh, VA nursing home in Kerrville where we did the treatment. And I'm, I'm showing you this layout because we figured if we could do something good in this layout, we could do it anywhere. This place was not designed as an Alzheimer's care unit. This is a whole nursing home unit that comes around this way. And all they did was close off a, a wing with the doors like that, and that was the Alzheimer's unit. So that was the locked area. And that's what it consisted of, one hall that was closed off. There's a, a yard in the outside for them to walk around in that uh, has a wall around it and a gazebo. So the men who like to wander around outside were free to do that. <coughs> The instruments we used were the Blessed Dementia Scale, the Folstein Mini Mental State, the, the Linton Piaget Test, and I'll tell you a little bit about that, the Nursing Home Behavior Problem Scale. And then we looked at their medications from their charts over the past 30 days and converted them into dose equivalents so that we could look to see um, if they were taking different medications, what the dose equivalent was so we could, um, were able to determine differences so what we did was um, we used the blessed dementia scale first to determine their capability for signing consent. And the blessed dementia scale is an objective measure that's done by somebody other than the subject, so we wouldn't have to bother the subject. And if they scored uh, a certain score on the blessed, if they scored below, then they, we would ask family members to give consent. This is a Piaget test that we developed from standard Piaget tests that were used for children. We modified them to use for adults. 
um, this is Edie Jessup who did all the Piaget testing. She had a wonderful rapport with the, the patients, the subjects. She's a nurse practitioner and um, so she did an excellent job with the testing and it was nice to have one person do all the testing so it would be consistent. Um, this this uh, is a pretend subject who um, is doing the formal operations test, which is categorizing, categorizing things into colors. Um, we try the tests on each other and on older people and uh, young people and all kinds of people, and everybody had a good time doing it. And nobody was offended that it was like a childlike thing to do. So. Um, it worked out very well. The, the test has been used a lot. It's been tested for reliability and validity, and it's, it's a very good test, and we've published on this test that Adrian Linton particularly developed herself. The nursing home behavior problem scale was used to measure uh, the nursing home be the behaviors that people demonstrated, the outcome variable. Um, it consists of six categories. The first is uncooperative or aggressive behavior. The second is irrational or restless behavior. Then sleep problems, annoying behavior, inappropriate behavior, and dangerous behavior. The uncooperative or aggressive behaviors like resisting care, um, being difficult, um, hitting people. The irrational or restless behavior is uh, pacing, um, generally being very agitated. Sleep problems were having difficulty getting to sleep or waking up and, and um, having problems being noisy and things like that. Annoying behavior was sort of whining and complaining. Uh, inappropriate behavior is um, wandering. And dangerous behavior, which is interesting to me, one of the dangerous behaviors is trying to get out of restraints. And I think if I had uh, dementia, I would try to get out of restraints too, but that's considered a problem behavior. So what we did was uh, we used the Blessed Dementia Scale for consent. We tested Piaget levels and mini mental state levels at year one, two, and three, so we did that yearly. They don't seem to change very much over the years. It's interesting. There's a very slow, steady downhill course. We um, did the Nursing Home Behavior Problem Scale and drugs. We collected data on that. The Nursing Home Behavior Problem <coughs> Scale you ask the primary caregiver of the patient um, over the last three days, has this be how often has this person demonstrated this behavior? So for the nursing home behavior problem scale, we did it weekly for four weeks and said over the last three days and we averaged the scores. For the drugs we did, uh, we collected from the chart the drugs that they were taking over that same month. We. Um, trained all of the staff, including dietitians, janitors, everybody who entered the nursing home unit was trained in caring for Alzheimer's patients. Um, we, our belief is, and our theory is that anybody going onto that Alzheimer's unit or working with Alzheimer's patients can stir them up. Uh, it's amazing, you can see somebody going into a special care unit and things are very calm and the patients kind of walk up and uh, sort of uh, cuddle up next to them and things are very calm, or somebody else can walk in the unit and it just stirs everybody up and they start getting agitated. So a lot of it is how the staff interacts. And we couldn't do the study without training all the staff. We initiated the treatment and at the same time began the drug withdrawal protocol. Uh, just a little bit about the staff training. All the staff, as I said, were required to attend. We made six one-half hour videos. Uh, the first three were about communication, sort of general principles of working with people with dementia. Uh, the non-professional staff saw the tapes one to three. The professional staff saw all of the tapes. The additional three tapes were based on our protocol for the study, including the drug withdrawal protocol. After they saw the tapes, they had to sign in. Um, they usually saw them before report or after report. Um, and so they had to complete all of the tapes. At the end, they received a research pin, which was uh, a wonderful idea of uh, Dottie Zai, who was our research associate. And uh, people were very pleased to get this little pin. It says, here's the pin, it says research services. And so everybody on the team, everybody who worked in the unit was part of this research team. 
and they loved it. We um, took suggestions from all the nursing assistants. You know, a lot of times nobody listens to nursing assistants. And um, they were trained in, in working with patients, and they just thought that was really neat. And if somebody new was hired, they had to ha go through all the tapes, too. You couldn't just have somebody new come on, and uh, it was consistent for everyone. So the treatment consisted of behavioral interventions, environmental interventions, and the drug withdrawal protocol. I have a teddy bear here for a reason, and um, I guess I can tell you right now, one of our behavioral interventions was the Spinoza bear. I don't know if any of you have heard of that. But the Spinoza bear looks exactly like that, but there's a little knob there with a heart. And uh, the knob has, uh, is able to turn on a video, I mean an audio tape, and you can put any kind of audio tape you want in there. It was developed for children who were going into surgery, and the parents would um, record, like, uh, say, Janie. You know, Janie, um, it's okay, mommy's here, mommy's with you. and. Uh, just kind of relax, and, and so you can put any kind of tape you want in there. Uh, we put music to calm them down, and this was the most successful thing, I think, of anything we used. When people became agitated, the nurses gave them the Spinoza bear to hold. It's a nice big bear, and um, they would play the tape, and it would calm people down. It was really wonderful. They wanted a Spinoza bear for everybody, but they're expensive. They cost about $125, so. They're pretty expensive, but that was one of our best interventions for uh, agitation and restlessness. We made up care plans based on the Piaget levels of each of the subjects, and they were color coded and laminated and kept in a file on each nurse's station. So, for example, yellow would be sensory motor interventions for all of these various behaviors and activities, which I'll show you in a minute. And, um, then the patients had uh, corresponding dots, so if a person was sensory motor, he'd have a little yellow dot on his wristband, on his door, so that people knew exactly what stage that person was in. And if there were, if the patient demonstrated a problem behavior or if they were going to engage in an activity, they could refresh themselves about how to approach the patient using these care plans. And here's an example of some of the care plans. Uh, for pre-operational, remember this children about two to seven years old, uh, and you know with children that age, when they're eating, you, you often have to assist with cutting their food for them. Uh, you may give them verbal encouragement to eat, and that's what we did with uh, the patients who were at the pre-operational stage. For sensory motor one, which is the late sensory motor, um, you know children at that age, like from one to two, they use finger foods often when they eat. Um, and often you can d demonstrate hand-to-mouth motion for these, the children and they will follow what you do. They'll, they're able to imitate a little bit. So um, you do that for a lot of the Alzheimer's patients and that has been used frequently but intuitively for people. When people didn't eat very well, when they couldn't use a knife and fork, when they had Alzheimer's, then intuitively people would give them finger foods and that would be very helpful because Often they won't eat a whole lot at one time, so you give them finger foods that are healthful during the day, and um, they'll eat them. And then sensory motor two, which is uh, early infancy, late Alzheimer's, that's when you feed the patient um, as you would a baby, um, talk to them in a warm, accepting voice, avoid rushing, so it's a very nurturing experience for the patient. Um, I sometimes hesitate to tell people this, but one of the things we did was for the sensory motor two and eating. Uh, you know, as I said before, we noticed that um, people who are in the late stage of dementia are lying in bed in a fetal position and they retain the sucking reflex. So I thought maybe if they sucked on something and ate, they could eat. Uh, whereas a lot of uh, people at this late stage have uh, the gastric tubes and they can't eat. So. Uh, we decided to try on one patient doing this. Um, it's all we could kind of do ourselves. So we got um, a, a large enough nipple for a man, and we got a goat nipple from this hunting store and put it on a bottle and had very thick kind of food in the bottle. And this is a man who had a, a gastric tube already. He couldn't eat. Uh, 
the physician checked him out for a swallowing reflex and all that, and he actually did take the nourishment. Um, the physician was most uncomfortable with this whole thing. We went in and put the curtain around the patient. And, um, but it's, it's sort of a, a way to think about what, what is good for the patient, whether it's comfortable for us or not. In Japan, they do a lot of this already. And uh, we're trying to think of a way to make it more acceptable to people. Could we get some nice pottery pot or something or, or put it on a bottle of beer or I don't know. So, um, and I'm sure it would be unacceptable to family members at this point. You know, it's just really a hard sell. And so we, we only did it with one patient, it was successful. So, um, who knows? Anyway, at this stage, um, one of the things that's most important, even they probably don't exhibit many behavior problems because they're essentially very ill people at the last stages of the disease, they're terminally ill. But it's a way to be nurturing for that person. Then for dressing, um, there are, are different stages where people are able to uh, dress themselves independently. Cornelia Beck in um, Arkansas has done a study with dressing, and she um, took dementia patients in a special care unit who were not dressing themselves at all, and she attempted to train them step by step to dress themselves. And she found out that some people could achieve this, some could achieve that, and some could achieve that, but she had no explanation for it. Uh, one of our doctoral students is doing a study now, she just started it, to see if there was a, a specific relationship between preoperational sensory motor one and two with these dressing abilities. Um, but as with a child, you'd lay clothes out in order, um, provide verbal coaching as you would for a, a child who's preschool or early school age for sensory motor because um, children at that age are able to imitate and Alzheimer's patients are too, have the patient imitate the caregiver dressing with step-by-step -step demonstration. And then for sensory motor to dress the patient and perhaps begin the dressing motion so that the patient can continue. So you can put the arm in the clothes, et cetera. And it's really very similar for all of these activities, sleep, rest, eating, dressing, whatever. You try to think of what would a child be able to do at that age, and then how can I best approach an Alzheimer's patient at that age? Uh, sleep was particularly difficult for us to, um, to show any improvement. We did show some improvement in sleep rest activities, but they, the improvement was not statistically significant. And um, we kind of wondered about that. And, we're, uh, it has led us to a whole other study actually on pain because we think that maybe people who um, can't sleep may have pain that they can't express. And actually when we did a follow-up study on pain assessment, we did find out that the people who um, were having difficulty with, activity, with sleep rest activities also showed, demonstrated um, symptoms of pain. So we think that that may explain why we couldn't with our interventions um, help them sleep better. But you know, it's, it's also hard because uh, older people also have a change naturally in sleep rest patterns, so it's hard to know what is the result of the disease and what is the result of pain. So that will lead to a whole lot more thinking and study. One of the uh, most successful things we did for sleep was if somebody had difficulty sleeping, we, we bought rocking chairs and we had them rock for a while. Uh, there was one man who was given Haldol every night because he got agitated when he was ready to go to bed. It turned out he was hungry. And um, so we bought graham crackers and peanut butter and soda. And he loved it. It, it. He ate and he was less restless and he was able to go to sleep. So it's sort of trying to figure out what the cause of their problems are is um, a real challenge. Music is an excellent cue for sleeping. We also had things like reading to them, <coughs> playing music for them, things that you would do for a child before bedtime. Uh, for toileting and elimination, um, most of the preoperational people are continent. Interestingly enough, incontinence doesn't really occur until the very late stages of the disease. You don't see incontinence a whole lot. Um, so in the preoperative Pre-operational stage, you, you remind them to go to the bathroom, toilet them about every two hours and after meals. Um, 
or for the sensory motor, you toilet them every two hours and after meals and um, give visual and verbal cues like colors, um, pictures of the toilet outside the room. In Sweden, they have, they took over uh, an old apartment flat and they made it into an Alzheimer's unit and it's all carpeted. And th the person there who's from there said, we never have a problem with incontinence or people not finding the bathroom because we have this yellow line along the wall that guides them to the bathroom and they've learned that follow the yellow brick road to the bathroom and you'll find it. The men in the VA really weren't too concerned about where they went to the bathroom or anything. They'd all be in each other's bathrooms or, or not use whatever was available as a container. Uh, bathing is another problem with uh, dementia patients and there's a lot of research going on about bathing. Um, older, the people with dementia, who the more the demented they get, the more they fear <coughs> the bath. And one study showed that um, they were most afraid of a shower coming from over their head, less afraid of a shower that was about um, waist length, waist height, and then a sponge bath was the, the least fearful for them. Uh, at one of the nursing homes in San Antonio, they have a fabulous bathtub that sort of is, it's not one that you go down into, it's about this high, and um, there's a little door that opens and the person sits on the side and gets in, and the water's on one end, and then the, the bathtub rocks back so that the water covers them, and so they're not fearful of the water. Um, there's a lot of, as I said, there's a lot going on um, in relation to bathing because it is very problematic with Alzheimer's patients and usually um, people need to resort to sponge bathing because uh, they're so afraid of the water. Uh, at pre-operational, they're not that as afraid as sensory motor, but um, it's helpful to be very calm in trying to get them into the, the bathroom, uh, explain the care in simple terms, break it down step by step. Uh, verbal prompting. Uh, for sensory motor one, we use cues to bath time, uh, like uh, music is a very good cue, uh, and I'll tell you a little bit more about music, um, certain songs that would indicate that it's bath time. Um, having a consistent bath time so that in the environment it's a familiar time to go to, the, to have a bath. Sometimes a comfort item to hold, like a stuffed animal, is helpful. Distraction um, is the best thing to use for Alzheimer's patients across the board. If they have something fixed in their mind that they want to do, if they need to be distracted, they can't be confronted or they'll get very, very agitated. So using distraction techniques are the best way to handle uh, somebody who um, has something on their mind that they want to do or if they become agitated or whatever and a sponge bath is good for the very sick people. Then we looked at some of the behaviors just to show you what we did with um, two behaviors, refusing care and wandering and agitation. Um, again, this is where distraction is very good for pre-operational uh, prompting to do the care, uh, move slowly, uh, redirection. Then for sensory motor one, uh, patterning and cues to start the activity and have the patient finish and don't rush them. Then sensory motor two, which is the infant, early infant uh, stage, um, you need to be very non-threatening, use a lot of comfort items, very nurturing. Uh, music is very helpful. And it's the same for wandering, same levels of things. As I said, redirect, distraction are all very helpful. Um, the dementia patients very much mirror other people's behaviors. So if a person comes into the unit who's agitated, as I said before, they'll agitate patients. Um, I mentioned how successful rocking was and some of the wheelchair patients could not rock. So we found a platform to put the wheelchair on so that they could rock in their wheelchair. And that was very successful. Um, to talk a little bit about environmental interventions, we used uh, signs and symbols, and that's why I put the stop sign there, because um, at certain levels, people are under, able to recognize symbols at the very late sensory motor stages and pre-operational. So if you put a stop sign somewhere, they will 
stop and redirect their behavior. So we put a stop sign on a door, for example, that we didn't want them to go through, and they would look at it, turn around, and, and leave. Um, so there are lots of, of ways to be able to use symbols for people. Usually they can read one word or use a symbol like that and understand it. In one nursing home, they had um, an elevator that went up to the first floor that took people outside. And so the patients who were in the dementia unit kept pushing the button and going up and outside. So they put a little sign over the button that said, out of order. And uh, we were there visiting, and we started going up the stairs, and they said, no, this is for the patients. And they look at the sign, it says, out of order. They can read those three words, and then they don't try to get on the elevator. Even though they see other people on the elevator, it's, it's amazing how that works. Uh, colors and pictures are very useful. Uh, music, as I mentioned before, is one of the best things to use. We used music to calm people who were agitated and as cues in the environment. We played music at certain times of the day, when it was time to eat, when it was time to go to bed. Uh, when they had a group activity, um, music was played. They pl sang the Star Spangled Banner, did the Pledge of Allegiance, um, and then at the end, they they sang or played whatever you play in the military when it's time to leave, whatever song that is. Um, we also looked for noise control, level control. Um, when an air conditioner is being fixed, if something is going on, it agitates the whole unit. Uh, so we tried to keep the noise level down as much as possible. Um, there was, there's been a controversy about the use of televisions. In this unit, all the televisions were taken out. You would think that it would help people have a television, but it got them very confused. They couldn't make sense of what was on TV, and the changing lights and colors were very distracting, and so was the noise. So they took out all the uh, TVs. Some of the family members were not very happy about that, but they found that the patients were much happier without the TVs. We also had items to attract interest, like a work board, a fish tank. We wanted to get a Jeep, because these are all ex-military men, and we thought the men would like to tinker. And we couldn't get it approved by central office, because they might hurt themselves or cut themselves on the Jeep or something. So we're still working on a Jeep. This is the work board. It was developed um, by occupational therapy, I, I believe, and it's uh, to help people with their fine motor coordination. And so it has a door thing and a, a little faucet and other things. And the men just were fascinated with it. They, it really kept them occupied. And so we got a second one. It was so successful. Um, interestingly, that faucet, the men would try to work the faucet and no water would come out. And so one man said to another, this faucet's broken. There's no water coming out. And the other guy said, well, I guess we'll have to get a plumber and fix it. <laughs> so they sort of had some sense of what was supposed to happen. Um, I told you about these walls that, that surrounded the um, grounds where the men could walk around um, and the use of symbols. Uh, we had about two or three men who kept trying to climb over the wall and did. They climbed up the bushes on the side and got over the wall. Uh, some of them had regressed and thought that they were in a prisoner of war camp and felt that they were obligated to escape. So uh, we try to think of some kind of symbol in the military that would have the, if they looked at it, they wouldn't attempt to jump off the, over the wall. So um, what they painted on each section of the wall was off limits. And uh, since the time, in the last two years, I think, since they painted that, not one person has tried to get over the wall. So you can see this, how the symbols work very well if they're very, um, precise and short and, and don't involve a lot of reading. But it was something they were used to and could recognize also. What we found, these are the results of our study. Oh, and I didn't tell you about the um, medication withdrawal. We had a medication withdrawal protocol that Mike Lichtenstein, our physician, worked with us on. It had been developed at Vanderbilt. And what it involved was just having the dose of the medications over a period of time and gradually diminishing the dose to the point where the, the drug was discontinued. We were very successful at decreasing uh, psychotropic medications in a lot of the people in this study. We weren't 
I was hoping we could get them all off the psychotropic medications, but we weren't successful in doing that. But we really either got them off or decreased them significantly. Um, this is what happened over a p period of three years with the Piaget levels and the uh, many mental state scores, which we used as a judge of how severe the Alzheimer's was, how severe their cognitive impairment was. And there were correlations over the three years uh, among the Piaget levels and the Folstein <coughs> scores. In addition, people went downward as they were expected to. We didn't have anybody going from sensory motor to concrete over the three years. Everybody went down except one person who was very high level sensory motor and it was kind of iffy whether they were pre-operational or sensory motor to begin with. But not only did their mental status go down, but also the Piaget levels went down. So they generally um, did um, decrease in their, their cognitive developmental abilities and also in their cognitive mental status. Um, this is, these are the overall nursing home behavior problem score mean scores. The treatment group is in <coughs> green, so they didn't start out quite as high, but they weren't, that, they weren't significantly different. And you can see they, they gradually went down. They went down significantly over the 18 months. Whereas the control group sort of went down and then they went up again and we're not sure if that meant that there was um, a Hawthorne effect where, you know, because they were in the study they were getting this attention or whatever. But their um, scores never went down significantly. So that was our first uh, triumph that we were able to at least decrease behaviors, problem behaviors at the same time we're taking them off drugs, which we, we weren't even that hopeful that we could decrease problem behaviors when taking them off drugs. These are the anti-anxiety drugs and um, the treatment group, again, went significantly down in their anti-anxiety groups over the 18 months, whereas the control group did not. They, they um, actually increased as well. The neuroleptic um, drugs were one of our greatest triumphs because over this period of time in the treatment group they went down significantly so there were very few neuroleptics by the end of the study whereas the control group continued to maintain their neuroleptics. This says west because I could not figure out how to get back in the table and change that. When you do PowerPoint it goes north, south, east, west and you fill in the table and I couldn't get back to make that control so that's the control group. Uh, there was no change in either group in the antidepressant medications, which we figured was a good sign because we're not treating depression, we're treating Alzheimer's disease. And um, so we felt that that was fine with us. We weren't really attempting to decrease depression. <clears throat> so all in all, we had a fairly successful study um, with these interventions where we were trying to intervene using a framework that was consistent with all the people in the study, for everyone in the study. Um, as I noted earlier, we were not in the subgroups of the nursing home behavior problem scale. We were able to reduce refusing care um, agi and agitation, but not significantly. We significantly reduced um, wandering. Actually, I, I take that back. We significantly reduced agitation and wandering. The two things that started us in the study, the two things that were being treated uh, with tri psychotropic medications, we were able to decrease using this study, so that was really good. We weren't able to decrease sleep behaviors, as I said before, and um, we weren't able to reduce the resisting care behaviors significantly, although we were re able to re reduce them. And in our pain pilot study, when we observed people for pain, we found out that the resisting care and the sleep were significantly re correlated with pain. So we're, the next study is not only um, to look at, try to assess pain in especially the severely demented people, the ones who are, who are at the sensory motor stages, uh, but to see if there's a way that we can manage the pain and also decrease behaviors. The next study in relation to our interventions we're hoping for is to um, take this to a daycare center. Uh, we're doing pilot uh, data collection now to see what kinds of, how we can enroll people in the subject and that sort of thing. Um, my dream has always kind of been to have a daycare center for Alzheimer's patients. 
based on a daycare center like children's so that when you, uh, you go to a daycare center the children are grouped into ages generally and I thought if we could group people um, into Alzheimer's stages and then uh, have activities for them that are appropriate for their cognitive developmental level that might increase their functioning or at least have them function at their highest abilities and hopefully decrease problem behaviors. And one of the things we did was um, we hooked up with a Montessori group because Montessori methods are based a lot on Piaget. And um, so we're hoping to have a Montessori daycare for Alzheimer's patients, but at a, an adult level. So um, we're still working on all these various tasks. And um, I think overall you could apply our principles without having to do Piaget testing. If you can just think about what kind of behaviors that Alzheimer's patients are exhibiting and use techniques that you would use on children like distraction, um, redirection, uh, nurturing, that sort of thing, rather than confrontation. Um, it, it tends to work better for Alzheimer's patients. Any questions? Uh-huh. Where do you find those large nipples you were talking about? Where do we find the large nipple? It's, um, Adrian Linton's husband's a hunter, and there's some store out in the land, which is, see, I'm not from Texas, so I don't know all these, but in the, where he has his thing that he goes hunting from, there are stores for hunting. Anybody, a hunter, anybody know? Or, it's a feed, store. feed store, maybe. So I'm a city person from the east, so this is all new to me. <laughs> um, but that was, it was very interesting. Um, and there's, you know, there's the debate about um, what is more dignified, having restraints, having a gastric tube, or doing these things that allow people to do what they can do and try to approach them at a reasonable level that they can um, manage better. Any other questions? Okay, thank you.